Alhamdulillah, um, it's very nice to be here with you all, and that there's nothing more that I would rather spend my time than that not so much talking to you as just a delving into this whole process of knowledge and reflection, and that, that once someone opens up their heart to intellectual uh, stimulation, and that they find the beauty of constant a constant pursuit of seeking of knowledge is that that really what comes to dominate the heart is an overwhelming love for what is known and that you know, Imam al Zaidi has a very interesting hierarchy of desire that he reports in his book Kitab al Ibrahim, the Book of Forty, and that he says that the human being at successive stages in his life has various shahawat desires start to form within them. And that he says the very first desire to form within the human being is the desire to eat and drink. And this is obvious because we see that as soon as a baby enters into the world, that the first thing that happens, as we see as a manifestation for us of God's name, the Hadi, the guide, is that the baby somehow intuitively knows to reach for their mother's breast. And that this is very significant. You know, how to explain that? Okay, instinct. Well, what is instinct? What is that phenomenon? How is that taking place? And we have a unique perspective on it. But this is the very first instinct that exists in the very first desire that exists within the human being is to uh, eat and drink. A natural uh, inclination exists within the human being for obvious reasons. If we don't have a desire to eat and drink, then how would we be able to preserve our physical health? And that we recognize therein that the, these natural desires that in of themselves is that they're not something negative. In fact, that there's a divine wisdom behind them. That if the Lord of the heavens and the earth had willed that we eat other types of food, like rocks or pebbles or yeah, I mean, leaves or just, you know, nourishment that was entirely bland or we didn't have taste buds or we didn't have desire, for instance, that it would be a lot more difficult to, to be able to preserve our health as human beings. And that, that there's, you know, in alternative forms of medicine that deal with holistic health, there's a lot to be said for desiring particular foods at particular times. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you reach for M&Ms and Starburst and you know, Mentos and these types of things. That's not what it's referring to. But at times you do find that you incline towards some types of food as opposed to others. And that some will say that this is an indication that that's actually what you need you know, in that moment, obviously with certain conditions. But he says that the, the next <coughs> desire that develops within the human being, after these basic desires of, of eating and drinking, is that the, the desire for copulation, that the desire that the sexes have for the opposite sex, and that, that this is a desire that comes a bit later uh, in, in the stage, and this is a natural desire in, in and of itself, that it's not a negative thing, that there's obviously great wisdom behind it, that were females not attracted to men or men not attracted to females, then that how would we then procure the human race? how we preserve the human race. And the very fact that there is a desire there that has an obvious you know, divine wisdom in it. But again, like the other desires, that it has to be regulated and it has to be channeled and that limits have to be set up a proper engagement in that. And then Imam Ghazali says is that as that the human years progress, that a third type of desire starts to develop in the human being and what he calls the desire for status, the desire for rank, the desire to be known by people, and that this is the third level, and again, also that actually that has wisdom in and of itself, and he goes into a detailed discussion of status and when it is desirable, when it is praiseworthy, when it is blameworthy, but the basic level of which clearly, according to Imam Ghazali, is needed, that if there's not a type of trust, or if you don't have, if you're not known by certain people, that they perceive you to be a certain way, that they're not going to hire you, they're not going to interact with you, 
they're not going to give you their business. So there's a certain level that has to be there. And that there's mechanisms in the sacred law that preserve this. And we have what is called marua, which, you know, it's a difficult word to translate, like a lot of other words in Arabic, but it's broadly defined as legal respectability. <coughs> right? Someone's reputation. And we have a hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad said, that a mu'min la yudhillu nafsuhum, that the believer doesn't humiliate themselves. So preserving your uh, your reputation is a good thing. Now that we have to clarify in this day and age that when you hear of things like honor killings and these type of things, that I would that you seek refuge in God. These type of things that are complete extremes, you know, and that that. Uh, these things have nothing to do with Islam whatsoever. This is something totally jahili and ignorant and has nothing to do with the way of the Prophet or Islam and it needs to be categorically spoken out against and condemned. But that the basic level though of preserving your reputation right, has to be there. But Imam you Ghazali know, will go into great detail then about how these different types of desires can be balanced and that all of the various afat or defects that arise when they are imbalanced in one or two directions. But the we're taking uh, we're, we're going down this 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 course to get to the fourth type of desire, which Imam Lazari argues is the most fundamental and simultaneously the strongest desire that exists within the human being, which is the desire to know. But this is something that that is deeply embedded within the human being, a desire to know. And that this represents the fourth so-called desire in the hierarchy of shahawat of desires. And again, though, that like the other three, that we have to have a balanced perspective of that the way in which we know and how we seek what we know and what we do with what we know. And I think you could argue from a religious perspective that a lot of the problems of the modern world that stem from a num all of these, you can see very clearly how they relate to problems in the modern world, all of these, you know, in the various imbalances, respective imbalances. But, you know, really at the fourth degree, which even though in terms of numbers that there might be less people that, that are part of this imbalance, but the repercussions that they reverberate into you know, all people. And that it's related to how we know and what we do with what we know. But that what I'm trying to get at here is, is that you know, a, a Muslim should love knowledge. And we should love intellectual stimulation. And that we should never feel hesitant to take part in any type of discussion. Whether it be with people that are operating from a religious perspective, or whether it be people that are operating from a secular perspective. And that at the heart of every believer should be a fervent, ardent desire for truth. And that we happen to believe, despite you know, postmodern conviction, that there is truth with the capital T. Now, our epistemology through which we affirm that is another topic of discussion. We tried to point to that briefly in the khutbah, but that's a, that's a more lengthy discussion. But the, the point is here, is that, that we have clearly defined parameters that relate to how we know, but this should be at the very heart of a believer. And what is understood in this hierarchy that Imam Uzzah is saying, is that the higher that you move up, the more fine-tuned one's taste is. And so that there is a quote, um, that uh, I believe that it was Eleanor Roosevelt, if I'm not mistaken. And that she said that the different types of people, that the lowest degree are people who talk about other people. You know, and you see people that are like this, people that go through the line in the uh, grocery store and they pick up People's Magazine. Or and even worse, that they're picking up the National Enquirer. And if people weren't reading that, they wouldn't publish it. Right? There's people that actually you know, like that type of literature. And that their whole life revolves around other people. And 
lifestyles of the rich and famous. I know I'm outdated. I don't know what in God's name they have now. Uh, but I guess they're running out of ideas, so let's just do reality TV. But I don't know what the sub the lifestyles of the rich and famous is old school. I haven't had a TV for like 16 years. We figured it out last night, so I don't know. But whatever it is, with the whole idea of living your life through other people's lives, that there's a really nice book by an author by the name of Chris Hedges. He's a graduate of the Harvard Divinity School, and he's an intense social critic, which I would highly recommend You know many of his books, but in particular his book, that War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, as well as his book uh, titled The Empire of Illusion. And that he says, the subtitle is, that the uh, triumph of spectacle and the loss of literacy, or something along that lines. And he has five different chapters, all of which are interesting. Uh, the chapter on pornography is very important, but it's very vivid, so you might want to just breeze over that. He has a very powerful critique of the modern university. But the first chapter, it relates to the way that people live their lives through these various programs that are presented to us in media. And that he says that a lot of the type of programs now, that in my day again, please excuse me, I'm not dated, it was called the WWF, now I guess it's called the WWE, is that right? That that people live their lives, and it's developed such that that people can have a psychological release that when they start to look at the, these lives of these people, that what they start to do is live through them in various ways. You know, and, and that's why, do you know what the most popular show is in the Muslim world, in the Arab world? What would you think? The most popular show in the Arab world. Arab No, no, but it's a, it's a Western show. <laughs> Baywatch. Right, who watches Baywatch anymore? Does anyone watch Baywatch anymore? Right, Baywatch. And if you would look at the number of, you know, people that, you know, feel inclined towards Oprah Winfrey, and that follow, and we're talking about oftentimes in very conservative societies that are completely segregated, segregated like Saudi Arabia, that there's thousands and thousands of women, really, without exaggeration, that learn to live their life through Oprah because they feel like that she's speaking to them, and that they learn to live their lives through these characters and so forth that she brings on her talk show and so forth. And that, that there's a lot of people that are like this, is that, that their whole discussion is around people. And then that a higher degree, according to Roosevelt, is that people whose discussion is around events. Then there's other people that they talk about events and interpreting events. And you have to have more of a background knowledge to be able to discuss an event. Which again, then I would argue that you know most people, that when they see events on television, they don't have the background knowledge to even understand those events. Because that if you look at a book like Neil Postman's How to Watch TV News, and you see the way that a 30-minute or even hour-long right, news <laughs> segment is presented, right, the substance of the topic at hand is, you know, you know, at best minimal. You know, and oftentimes it's, prevent, it's presented in a particular frame. In order to really develop your own opinion on it, is that you have to do actually a lot of reading, a background reading. And that oftentimes you actually have to visit the place. And as a person who has a foot literally in two worlds, the West and the East, I own a home in a controversial country, Yemen, which I've only had beautiful experiences there for the most part, that you see very clearly that the way that perspectives on both sides, if you want me to be fair, are skewed and distorted. And that you see the pitch in the media compared to what you know on the ground, and you, you start to see that how, that if that's a person's only source of information, that they're not going to be able to develop it. And it's actually, for myself, really quite annoying that you get these people that are like parrots, where they don't have any idea what they're talking about, but they're just like, they hear something on CNN or NBC or some, you know, uh, some broadcaster is, is you know, giving them an opinion or some so-called expert or, you know, political analyst, 
and that they don't think from themselves. They're just presenting what they heard. That if you really get down to the nitty gritty and like, how do you develop your opinion? And why do you think that? Right? Well, how can you have that particular opinion if you've never exposed yourself to a different opinion? That how could you develop that? So, this is the second degree. She then says that the highest level of inquiry, intellectual inquiry, is where you start to discuss ideas. You start to discuss, discuss concepts. And that is where it really gets interesting. It's starting to discuss ideas and concepts. And that, you know, we do have mechanisms in the sacred law. That at times you see, like for instance in the topic of philosophy, traditional scholars differ about what was the legal ruling of philosophy. Some of them said philosophy is haram. That opinion does exist. And that the way that position is understood, if people don't have a philosophical mind, that it's better to have them focus on orthopraxy, which is orthopraxy relates to that uprightness of behavior, right? That you focuses on behavior, as opposed as opposed to orthodoxy, which is focused more upon that rightness of belief. You know, where in the Christian tradition there was much more focus on ortho orthodoxy as opposed to orthopraxy. And that this is actually a blessing for us if we look at it from an overarching historical vantage point. That that we have in the Fatiha in the last two chapters, in the last two verses, <laughs> not the ways of those who've incurred your wrath, nor the way of those who've gone astray. Given us the two basic archetypes for human deviation. That one is having a knowledge of something but having the lower passions overcome you such that you don't act according to the dictates of, dictates of what you know. The second archetype are those that actually have skewed knowledge and a skewed perspective and thus are, lead themselves astray. And so these are the two basic paradigms. Um, but that, that if you see that historically, that our scholars have inclined more towards orthopraxy in general, than orthodoxy. And one of the great proofs of that is, is if you go into any traditional library, that what are the most that voluminous books? What sciences do we have that the largest collections of books are what? Fifth? Come on. I heard fifth from someone. And what else? Mormon. Right? Well, that's fifth. Right? Hadith. Fifth and hadith. Whereas if you compare that to Christendom, that the quintessential science was theology, hands down. And if you look at a book like, you know, two of the most famous scholars of Christian history, that St. Thomas Aquinas and that uh, Augustine, is that, that you know, Aquinas is that Summa the, the, uh, Theologica, that it's primarily a book of theology. Right? And then if you look at uh, you know, Augustine's of the city of God or his confessions. That it's primarily a work of theology. That was, you know, the science that was of most importance. Whereas that our scholars have a very clear cut developed theology. And that we that's a whole topic, the way that we uh, present our theology, creed as opposed to some of the more nuanced understandings of experiential theology of how we understand the soul and how it relates to the higher realms and so forth. That that never became mainstream. That was always dealt in an entirely different genre, such that the onlookers that first looked at the Islamic tradition, tradition thought that we had a very basic, you know, rudimentary theology. Which, from the standpoint of creed, it is basic. Which is the power of Islam. In which one of the main five reasons surveys have shown that people actually become Muslims because of the simplicity and clarity of Muslim belief. Where you're not required to believe some abstruse point of theology that even, you know, the Archbishop himself might understand. You know, except just, it's how it is, it's a mystery, accept it. But no, you actually, Allah says in the Quran, fact them and know that. It is a Quranic imperative, it's a Quranic injunction that you know God, know that there is no God but Allah. Meaning that the scholars have said that far from being a voluntary matter, that if you have the intellect 
to come to know God, meaning what we attribute to God on a rational basis, which is the whole science of discursive or speculative theology, that it's an obligation for you to do so. And if you don't, you're actually sinning. That's the dominant position of, of our of our theologians. And so there's there's an encouragement to that. But so we do have a very developed theology, but the largest books of ours are in the realm of fiqh and the realm of hadith. And then after that, you could probably say tafsir. And then there's a number of other uh, you know, aspects of our tradition as well. Tafsir is commentary uh, on the Quran. But this is actually a blessing that we see looking back in retrospect. That if we're going to lean to one way or another, that there is more of a lean, more of a lean towards orthopraxy. That that's actually a blessing. Right? But taking back to the whole uh, point of this discussion is is that that as people who believe in this stuff, that it's very important for us to have intellectual courage. Is that is that we should never be afraid to compare what we believe to what other people believe. That we should welcome that. And we should welcome inquiry, and we should welcome challenges, and we should welcome questions, and that we should welcome criticism. And what you'll find is when you do that, that when there is intellectual honesty, is that it will solidify. And this is my own personal experience, having you know, left the university, gone the traditional route, studying in those places, not as long, was exaggerated, as he said, but that studying in, in those places, and coming back and re-entering the university, and to me, that the university has been a wonderful experience. And I actually have very good relationships with a lot of my professors, that some of them are secular Muslims. And, you know, I'm just, I am who I am. I don't try to, you know, be other than myself. I dress as I dress in the university, outside of the university. This is who I am. I don't really care if people like it or not. But this is who I am, and I'm going to be who I am. And that, um, at the same time, I have a professor of mine who's complete atheist, and uh, sometimes even makes fun of religious people. But we have a very, very close relationship. Not close relationship, we have a very good working relationship. And that, that um, you know, and I think that what it is, is that he, he appreciates, you know, the, the intellectual honesty. Is that we have to access our tradition, analyze it as it is. And we should never be worried about doing that. Whether it's from within our own ranks, in scrutinizing you know, critically analyzing and at times scrutinizing certain positions of scholars of the past with balance and adab, taking into consideration that people didn't always live in the modern world. If I can just stop and take a quick tangent before getting to that, this is one of the major blinders of people in our time, is that when you try to look back upon history, is that most people cannot and you could argue philosophically that you can ne never possibly do it, but you know, having lived literally in a pre-modern society that doesn't even have running water and electricity, that you know, it really is interesting to see the perspective of people that are operating in a pre-modern mentality. Because there is a lot of people in the world in general, and you might even be able to argue, you know, I don't know if it would reach a majority, but there's a large percentage of people that still operate in a pre-modern mentality. You know, where I don't, you know, I've seen too many beautiful people overseas to think, you know, that they're like heathens or they're, you know, backwards. And I mean, I don't buy that stuff. You know, to me, one of the most, in certain ways, depending upon how you define advanced civilizations that I've seen, are the more Mauritanians, which are some of the simplest people in the world, which until 15, 20 years ago, they were still literally Bedouins, nomads, moving from place to place, wherever the water might be depending upon the season and rainfall and so forth. And that despite they're the second poorest country in the world, at least that was a statistic from some time ago. But despite that, that they were an amazing people that that, you know, had traits that I have I haven't seen in the most civilized people. And that that the people that I, you know, developed intimate relationships with the man that I converted with, uh, his name is Sheikh Khotri Wulbeba, that his half sister was the Wife of Marabu al Hajj, may Allah have mercy upon her, she's passed. Marabu al Hajj is still alive. And that he to me was like a father. And I remember that uh, when I first wanted to go to Mauritania, oh my god, yeah, that's a whole story of the self of my parents. You know, you're leaving 
you know, pay for your education to go to UC Berkeley in this future. And you know, what my mom always wanted for me is to live in a nice white picket fence and have, you know, two children and live the American dream and so forth. But all of a sudden, I'm going to Africa, where you know I'm not going to be able to speak to her except to, you know, every two or three months. And she, you know, literally, like she didn't take that too well at first. And that I remember when they first met my teacher, Sheikh uh, Hotel, that, that you know, he was reassuring them that I would be safe and so forth. And he said, we're going to take better care of them than you do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that literally, though, that it was like a, a father son type relationship. It's very intimate. And that's very, it's, you know, it's very unique. It was, it was the relation, the student teacher relationship, which you find that sometimes in the university, uh, but you know, in the Muslim world much more but it was a very intimate, close-knit student-teacher relationship and that it's very important to the whole process of learning and the realization of you know, the realities and the ultimate purpose of knowledge. Uh, anyhow, that, you know, taking this back to what we were, you know, what we were discussing is that, you know, so people don't often have, times have the ability to divorce themselves from you know, judging the past based upon the lives in which we live. And I, I would argue that people, that they don't realize how, you know, that the majority of human beings have not walked this earth and lived like the way that we live. But if you even look at the remaining people that lived, you know, in, in, in the early 20th century, in the early 1900s, there's a few of them still around. That what was their realities? What was the reality of life in the United States of America before the radio, before electricity, right? before airplanes, let alone you know, before internet, and so many of these other things, satellites, cell phones, and so forth? What was their lives like? What was the way that they used to live? And that, let alone when you get a little bit further back, the majority of human beings that have walked the face of this earth. You know, we're, we're coming at the very end of everything. And that the majority of these live very differently. And that in order for you to understand oftentimes the way that that worked, you have to understand that the dynamics of that particular juncture in history. So one example of that is, is that if you want to talk about, you know, we have a breakdown that is not a Quranic breakdown, but it's a scholarly breakdown that came later, of dividing that the Muslim uh, polity and then in relation to non-Muslim polity that into categories such as daughter of Islam, the abode of Islam, daughter of Kufr, the abode of disbelief, daughter of Harb, the abode of war. And there's a lot of scholarly difference upon this. You also have other abodes as well, daughter of Aman, the abode of security, daughter of Mu'ahada, the abode of treaty. You have different abodes, and that, you know, that was very much a part of the pre-modern world, and that you could see the functional aspect of you know, this type of division, because the way that society and civilizations that not only survived but prospered and spread, that you have to understand the way that that was, in order to understand the importance of that breakdown. And now, you know, the challenge is, is that as we move into the time where so many things have broken down. That, that this is the most important time of all, that we have nuanced scholarship that can look into you know, the, these details and so forth. Um, and I'm, I know that this is not what you wanted me to speak about, so I'll try to get to what you said. But I wanted to, you know, that, to, to but really, I think it's really important you know, that we all learn to love knowledge and that we, we enjoy intellectual stimulation where we, we think more people of death. And that, that I, I would say that, um, you know, in, in response to that, uh, you know, that this you know, issues of this sort that, that, that need to be addressed, is, is that, that we're living in a time that requires nuance. And that one of the tendencies of different people that you find in our time is that as the challenges escalate, is that you see certain responses to these various challenges. You know, one of the great challenges, if you want us to be honest, that we're dealing with is 
certain people within our communities. That their response to, you know, I'm calling it modern team, whatever that means, is that they want to run from it, they don't want to engage in it, and they want to create black and white dichotomies that there's clarity in their mind and they live in diaphragm. Now, if someone's going to do that and that remain within their own realm and to not engage, you know, I personally don't have a problem with that. Because you can't require everyone to engage and to have calculated integration. And if someone wants to do that, we have Amish people that, you know, reject much of modernity. We have, you know, people that go and form intentional communities and they don't want to have anything to do with the public sphere, and that's fine. But we shouldn't force everyone to be the same way. If someone, that, that's just their response, ah, no, we'll say, I don't have a problem with that. However, that if you universalize your approach, and then even worse, try to uh, justify religiously that the way that you're viewing things that is the only way to respond and everyone else who doesn't respond that way is wrong right? you are setting yourself up for disaster within your own selves and within other people as well you know and this is at the heart of that, you know one of the major tendencies within our community of, of that you know this problem of you know, I don't know what you want to term it, you know, that, but it's create, it's related to you know, creating these, these false dichotomies. Is that in a time where things become extremely complex, is that you're, to the degree of its complexity, is to the degree that you're in need of nuance. And that what I would say to that is, is that, that you, could, you could analyze, you know, the trial, which we call in Arabic a fitna. But the, the very definition of a fitna is, is that you can understand that it's a trial, but there's no easy way out. Right? So, for instance, that, you know, a leader like Saddam Hussein, in everything that he did to his people, and so forth and so on, that you can understand that all Muslims would say, virtually, you know, that he's a tyrant, and this and that, da, 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 and so forth and so on. <coughs> but, you know, how do you get yourself out of the civil, out of that situation? And what is the uh, alternative to that civilization? This is something that now is taking place right now as we speak in the Muslim world. This is right at the surface, where you see all of these varying perspectives in relation to the Arab Spring and so forth, and this new stage now of, of governance in the Muslim world, and how that relates to the West, and how that relates to democracy, and so forth, and so on. Uh, and I'm not going to give any definitive answers to all of them. My point is, is that you can understand the trial. But oftentimes the very definition of a fitna, of a trial, is that, that there is no easy way out. Because that is exactly what it is. It's a trial. You know, and we have in our lives various types of trials. There are certain relationships that you have. That you might have a family member that, you know, just irks you and is troubling you. And it's just a thorn in your side constantly. And it's a trial. You know what you can and can't do on the two extremes. Right? You don't have to subjugate yourself to any type of emotional, physical, or verbal abuse or anything of that sort. At the same time, their family, nor can you completely cut them off. Right? Where is the fine line of how you deal with that? Or sometimes it's with your parents. Other times it's a spouse and their husband, the husband and wife, the two spouses. And they have kids, and there's no options to for divorce because it would lead to a disaster, but you're trapped in the relationship. But so you can identify oftentimes with a fitna, with a tribulation, the two extremes. But determining how you actually navigate, you know, the, the middle, that, that oftentimes is something that is that is very difficult. And that um, it's important though that when this is the case, is that we have a nuanced outlook. And that one of the things about the Islamic tradition, that it's extremely, extremely vast. And I don't think people realize the contributions, the civilizational contributions that that Muslims have made, in particular that are scholarly tradition. And some of them unique civilizational contributions. 
like the science of Islamic legal theory, Usul al -Dil. The Islamic legal theory is a unique science, it's a unique contribution, and that it developed at a particular juncture in Islamic history, and that the primary founder of it was the great Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i in his work on Risad. And that what he focused on, as opposed to many of the other books of fiqh, that focus on the branch rulings that relate to law as it's understood in light of the Quran and Sunnah, meaning the statements and practices and uh, tacit approvals of our Prophet, that he got to the heart of the overarching principles through which that the individual rulings of the laws are derived. But if you see someone who is a master of the Sulu Fiqh, that they also, generally speaking, will be a master of theology. They will also be a master of grammar and rhetoric. That oftentimes they would have uh, expanded into a knowledge of, of philosophy. And that they have this unique skill set that really what would be somewhat similar, as is close you're going to find in the Islamic tradition, to what would be called a liberal arts education of the West. Because the Western tradition, that, that the roots of it was based in the trivium and the quadrivium. That the trivium being that grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And the quadrivium being geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music. You know, these were the seven foundational knowledges that was a part of a liberal arts curriculum, right? and this is what essentially the institution I teach for is a tuna college, is that what they're attempting to do, that they're trying to create a Muslim liberal arts college in the United States, where it is trying to attempt, you know, because this is a big claim, no one's claiming anything, attempt to bridge the gap between the Western tradition and the Islamic tradition in light of our context here in the United States, and to try to contribute unique you know, Islamic solutions to you know, many of the problems that we face as, as human beings and as humanity. And that, you know, what exactly that means, it's not concrete and there's no ready answers. This is a long topic of discussion that takes you know, years upon years of, of integration and reassessment to actually come to any level of, you know, it's, it's, uh, solidification of a curriculum and understandings in that. Anyways, that, that the, our, our science of Islamic legal theory is really interesting. But which one of us has even studied a basic text of Islamic theory, or even heard about its importance? And this, to me, I would, would argue, is one of the most important sciences that we need to study in light of our time. Because that once you understand what are called the maqasid of sharia, which are the, the, the principles of law. You know, it's loosely related to Usul uh, al That you, you start to understand that all of the individual rulings of the law relate to these overarching principles. And some scholars say they're five, others say they're six. But it's related to preservation of religion, preservation of life, preservation of intellect, preservation of property, preservation of lineage, and what's the sixth? Honor, the preservation of honor. Thank you. So those are the overall, so meaning that every detailed ruling of the sacred law relates to one of these five in one way or another. And so then what you have to do is, is that, that, that as our scholars have said, that al hukum far'un an tasawwuri, for you to make a judgment on something, to give an opinion. You know, so this whole idea of what's your opinion, brother? What's your opinion, sister? Where everyone's just kind of, you know, giving their opinion in this type of way. That, yes, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But, you know, in the end, you should have an informed opinion. That you should have thought about it, and it should be an opinion based upon knowledge and conviction. Right? Not just taqalid, where you heard someone else say it, and so that, uh, I can't see your side, 10, that not just what someone else said, and that's it. 
Right? But, but what you see is, that it, which I just really want to get at, and we'll open the door for questions, is, is that the way that it's nuanced. Because then, is that you have to examine things based upon their musadah and their mufasid. That you have certain things that are of benef benefits, you then have certain things that are harms. And the, the way that you apply law in any times is that you have individual rulings of the Sharia that each relate to one of these five or six overarching principles, which that if we can take attention real quickly, that everything from this perspective, every individual law, even if you don't understand it, that it's rational, given the aforementioned <coughs> assumptions. Now, when you're dealing with secular law, it has a different set of assumptions that someone might deem what you believe to be <coughs> irrational. But looking at it from an internal perspective, that's not the case. It is rational given that it's related to one of these five or six things. But then what happens is, is that as you try to analyze and respond to the various challenges in your time, is that it requires a very in-depth knowledge of these overarching principles and that how it relates to their preservation <coughs> and interpreting that the challenge of your time in light of this tradition and that giving precedence to the benefits as it uh, over over the uh, the harms and that what you'll find is is that it's it's fairly easy to determine that right from wrong in a very general sense that when something you know the Quran rejects moral relativism we understand what's right we understand what's wrong in certain things but halal being with haram being but that at, at another degree, that understanding what is the writer of two rights, you could say that, or the wronger of two wrongs, or that what takes more precedence to focus on in terms of your list of priorities, or that how to deal in a situation when that no matter what the outcome, it's not something, you know, good. That either way, that it's not going to be the perfect or desirable outcome. How to deal with that situation which is a good percentage of the situations that we deal with on an individual basis, on a community basis, are as such. And that this is why that it's so important to be nuanced, because either way, we're all making decisions in our life. We're all making decisions, constantly. And that you're either just making your decisions haphazardly, right, or you're making informed decisions. We're all making decisions. And when it gets down to it, practically speaking, boom, we have to make a decision that oftentimes people don't have recourse, or even if they do, they don't go back to even, you know, have people that have an informed opinion help them in that. And this is one of the challenges as well, is that the number of informed people that are grounded in tradition, at the same time understand the nuances of the modern world, are few and far between. And if they're there, they're hard to reach, or they might not respond to your emails. Anyways that we're saying all of this is, is, that, is that I think it's really important um, that we develop a nuanced understanding of our tradition and that we rise to the intellectual challenge that, that in a time of difficulty is that, is that the worst thing that you could do is create a false dichotomy. Is that, that what you have to do is that further the depths of your knowledge and to understand things from a, a very subtle perspective and that when you start to see that the way that a scholar that analyzed one particular ruling, for instance, in all of the considerations that were there, it will leave you in a state of complete awe. And that, you know, that one example of that, not a concrete example, but a general example of that is, is that, that when, for instance, our, when our great jurists, like Imam Malik, like Imam Ashafi, like Imam Abu Hanifa, like Imam Ahmed Khan, is that when they were considering a, considering a, a particular ruling in the sacred law, is that they didn't only consider that based upon one source, whether it be a verse of the Quran or a hadith of the Prophet. Rather, they consider that point, that individual ruling, in light of the entirety of the Quran, and to the extent of their knowledge of the corpus of hadith. Because oftentimes we'll have different rulings that appear to be contradictory. Or that have various levels of authenticity in narration. What do you do in that particular scenario? And likewise, they would also take into consideration 
that the way that that individual ruling relates to other individual rulings that they've already come to basic conclusions on. And so that this is why that, that there's definitely things that missed earlier scholars that later scholars picked up on. Is because that that previous scholar might not have taken everything into consideration. Where the later scholar came and had the privilege to, because it was developed to a certain level, that they could think about those other considerations. So we tend to think at times that, you know, an example of that is you take a Quranic verse and that it's one level to understand what is the literal meaning of that verse. It's another level to take into consideration why that Allah mentioned that in that particular way and didn't mention it in other ways. And that, that opens up a whole other aspect of knowledge and it requires a greater depth. You know, I, I go mind blank. What did you want me? What was the, the essence of what we no? But what we, what did we talk about when we were walking? I want to just touch on it real briefly. Uh, maturity. Anyway, and so that that that's how I wanted to basically approach this topic about you know that that maturity. You know, and that that it, there was a things that was asked to speak about you know something related to that, and and I think it, it, it from from the Fafir's perspective it relates to what I mentioned. Is that that the we need to become mature in that sense? Is that that we need to get beyond, you know, a lot of this, you know, very simplistic remedial type of discourse that is dividing our community. And I'm, I'm making this address in particular now to the Muslim community. Is that we all know what is taking place at the Masjid level, at the community level, and oftentimes at the MSA level, where that the level of discourse that people are preoccupying themselves with and arguing over is so petty given the overall perspective that it's just beyond me actually if you want me to be honest you know and to me that that as a convert to Islam that I refuse to be bogged down by the baggage of our Muslim community now I don't mean by that I'm going to divorce myself from this some people choose to do because they think it's just rather than deal with all this stuff Right? I'm just going to become Muslim and just kalas. Just, you know, remain on the fringes maybe, you know, attend Juma and leave and just, I don't want people, some people don't want to be a part of it. And that's fine. I don't choose that position. You know, I think that we, sh we need to work within the Muslim community while working within the greater community. And, but at the same time, is that we have to look 50 to 100 years down the line. And that accessing our tradition, understanding how that Islam is really going to become relative in our society. You know, in, especially for Muslims. You know, in what are the ways that we're going to navigate that living in a modern, liberal, secular democracy? And what does that mean? You know, getting beyond, like, Islam's against democracy. Or this type of thing. Like, to, like, really, like, what is democracy? What are the different types of democracy? That do we have anything similar in our tradition to democracy? That what is Islamic political theory? Some argue there is no such thing. Because that we only have a few books and they're extremely short about political theory, which is very interesting. That does Islam have something to say about politics? Absolutely. But let's just say what we know about it, how relevant is that overall to what we want to be doing here anyway? You know, and we need to get beyond you know, this petty discourse where we really get down to the heart of certain issues. And a lot of that, you know, is maturity. And that, and that requires an intellectual maturity. And it requires simultaneously a spiritual maturity. Because oftentimes people's, that spiritual immaturity, meaning the state that they're in, prevents them from that developing this intellectual maturity. And to really fairly, justly, but open-heartedly accessing that our legacy, that our scholars have, have left behind, and that the great Muslims, scholars, and awliya, saints, that, that proceeded uh, before us, and that to me, that, that you know, this is something that I live my life by, and I have to say that from this standpoint, is that the more you delve into it, subhanAllah, that the more beautiful it becomes, and the more that you realize the vastness of the ocean, and how you know, the depths of the sea, and that in reality it's a shoreless sea, that it's amazing. 
and that, that you know, there's just so many ideas that can be flushed out, and there's so many historical examples that, you know, and I'll end on this last note, and it relates particularly, one of the main concepts that I would argue we have to understand if we're going to have intellectual maturity, in, in a sense spiritual maturity, that we have to understand the universality of Islam. Because Muslims believe that our Prophet was a universal Prophet. Right? And that to me, it's amazing that you have, geographically speaking, the Arabian Peninsula was one of, one of the most, one of the least universal places. You know, in, 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 in now, in one perspective that we call Mecca Umm al Qura, the mother of cities, or the idiomatic translation, the embryonic city. And if you look at the land mass of, of you know, the, the different continents, that for the most part, even though not um, you know, longitudinal, but in terms of the land mass, it is in the center, you know, with the exception of Antarctica. You know, it is very much in the center. You know, but the Arabian Peninsula was an impenetrable sanctuary for much of history. And there's, that's part of the geographic miracle you know, of you know, the Prophet's teachings and Islam, which you know, is an incredible topic that some have researched, like Dr. Omar. And that, uh, however, that, you know, this was one of the ways in which the pristine Arabic tongue was preserved because of the lack of interaction, as opposed to a city like Jerusalem, and that the multifarious you know, influences on you know, anything in a given moment, uh, religious uh, belief or otherwise. But um, you know the thing is, is that once you understand the universality of Islam and how it pertains to the entire world in every time, from the time of our Prophet and to every subsequent generation to the end of time, and all peoples on the face of this world, is that theoretically speaking, is that Muslims believe that Islam is for all times and for all people. But you oftentimes find in individual Muslims very narrow perspectives that they can't even deal with people in their own masjid, right? let alone with the greater Muslim community. But our Prophet, this is something you can be certain about, is that his universal nature would have allowed him to deal with every single human being. In his time, until Yom Kippur, to people that when you go outside, and believe me, I see these people in Berkeley, that some of the most distant people from the fitra, the natural state of the human being, that think that they, you know, this is the, the way that they should be lived, and the way that they pierce themselves, and mar their own skin, and, you know, tattoos, and substances that they consume, and so forth and so forth, that the Prophet said, would have, would have had an ability, theoretically speaking, to interact with everyone. And that, theoretically, everyone would have found something in the Prophet's life, an aspect of his, identity, of his personality, of who he was, that would attract him. You know, and then ultimately the higher levels of spiritual development is to the extent that you mold yourself to the prophetic personage, is to the extent that you obtain uh, divine guidance, but that the universality of Islam is very important. And that if we can understand that, that when you understand how Islam spread to the Persian, how Islam spread to the Indian subcontinent? How Islam spread to Egypt? How Islam spread to North Africa? How Islam spread to Southern Europe and Spain? How Islam spread to the Southeast Asia and the Malay world? How Islam spread to Sub-Saharan Africa? How Islam spread to China in Central Asia and then China? And then that what is the way that those people that integrated Islam based upon their own cultural heritage? And this is incredible topic that requires an immense amount of knowledge, an immense amount of research, but things are coming out, but this is part of the intellectual challenge that, that we need to have the courage to look into and to see what are the various parallels to our own situation here and what are some ideas you know, that, that we can draw from you know, into you know, some of the challenges that, that we're facing. So that's uh, about all that I have to say. I guess we can open up the I have a 
reflecting and thinking about my time here at UCLA and in MSA. And as a student, there's a lot of things going on in your mind. You're very concerned about your career, doing well in school, uh, you know, developing relationships with friends, and you know, the MSA and the activism and all that you're doing. And so sometimes the Islamic studies is almost like it takes a, it takes a back seat, you know, pursuing Islamic knowledge, memorizing Quran, doing other things. Because it's difficult to fit that in when you're so concentrated on so many other things. Or, and, and that's why I really understood this is a confusing time for a lot of students, especially the environment we're in. Um, and also, there are certain groups, and we have certain, there's a certain attraction to the simplicity that we see in Islam, or the simplicity that is offered in, uh, by certain you know, speakers. And that's, it makes it very easy for a student, especially to take that simplicity and practice on a daily level, on a daily life. Level. And that's what the attraction is. What you mentioned, I like what you mentioned about the, the nuance and the priority. A lot of times we look at the nuance and everything else except in Islam. We are very concentrated into our classes. We sit and we can listen to professors speak for on and on, and whatever subject we're on. But when it comes to Islam, it's very difficult for us to sit and learn for some reason. We want it to be fed to us, and we don't want to take that step to, to, to pursue it. Although we're taking those steps in every area of our life except Islam. Um, and I think it's because... So do you have a question? No, <laughs> so, what well, is this a lawyer? So, so if there was a judge in the room, then you would ask him, like, do you have a question? <laughs> So, um, I usually address her on um, My question is... No, I got your question. Yeah, so, so, Yanni, what do we do about that, basically? Exactly, exactly. Yanni, what are the priorities we should take? Right, exactly. No, I think it's just very clear that ultimately that it's all about balance. And uh, it's very important to simultaneously focus upon our intellectual development in a prodigious Islamic sense, while simultaneously regarding the horizons of our mind a general ed or postgraduate degree type education, and at the same time not forgetting your know, spirituality. And the key to all of that is is to learn how to divide your time wisely, which is very hard to do. And that there's a lot of things out there to distract us, especially at the college level. And this relates to maturity in that sense, is that that you know you have a choice. You, know, that you can go out and party, you could go out and do other things. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't uh, have halal fun, you know, lawful fun, but what I'm saying is is that, that you know, people do make choices. And that I would say that, that you know, the state of the believer is, is that we're, people, we're very serious people. That we have a very clear-cut perspective on life. And that we have to have times where we laugh, we have to have times where we relax and go to the beach, and we have to have times where we, you know, have downtime. That's a given. But that one of the golden principles I've heard from my teachers is, is that that you have to be multif in your jid, and you have to be more jid in your multif. Is that you have to be gentle in your times of seriousness, and you have to be serious in your times of gentleness, right? And that to the extent that you can do that and live a life of purpose, that you'd be surprised. Imam Wazadi says that that we have 24 hours in our day, and that if you're sleeping eight hours a day. That's a third of your life gone. And you have 16 hours left. That, okay, let's say you cut back on your sleep a little bit. Anyways, that you have a very limited amount of time during the day. But if you learn to organize your time wisely, and that you learn to place certain things at certain times, that you'll learn to get the blessing you know, of your time. And that certain there's people that have Balaka, they have blessing of their time. And again, it always gets back to the golden principle uh, of balance. And so by arranging your time correctly and sticking to that to the extent possible, that, that you will find blessing in your time. And that, that you will, you know, uh, you, you will be open to achieving in a number of ways. And, I, you know, to me, in the end, that as hard as school is and as demanding as it is, it's not always like that. Usually... People don't do work anyway until the end of the semester. You know that. But the, the point is, is that that you know, it's about priorities. And in a sense, you you have to have priorities in your life. And that if you set your priorities right, and you make sure that there are certain things that you definitely do, that again cater to your, you know, that you have times when you study, you have times where you focus on devotions, you have times for exercise, you have times for, you have times spend with your friends. That I think it really gets back to. You're having a high aspiration and arranging your time wisely. 
and also benefiting a lot from your free time. But also, you have four months off. You have a month off in the winter, and you have three months off in the summer. For the most part. How do you use that time? And what is it the things that you do? And that you'll find a lot of the complaints get back to a misuse of your time, which again gets back to this whole idea of maturity. I don't know if someone else might have any comment. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning of your talk, you uh, mentioned that Islam teaches to seek truth. Okay, In the Christian world, the way to seek truth is basically read the Bible, pray, and the Holy Ghost reveals truth to you. Mm -hmm. Now I found that that's not a real good mechanism because you have a lot of different denominations, Jehovah Witness, LDS, Protestant, that all believe very different things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's absurd that God would tell one person that there's one truth and another Christian person that there's another truth. Mm -hmm. So how does Islam teach to find truth? How do you know that it, that Muhammad's a prophet, that the Quran's truthful, mm -hmm. that sort of thing? Well, I mean, that's a very good question. And I think that, that it could be answered in, in a number of ways, but what I would say is, first of all, that, you know, truth with a capital T, that there's different aspects of truth. So if we would hone in on one aspect of truth, which let's say the existence of God, that um, the Muslim perspective on that is, is that, that the belief in God is a divine gift. It's something that God gives you or he doesn't give. It's a divine gift. And at the same time, when we were talking about, from a theological point of view, of learning proofs, rational proofs, that even if you learn a lot of rational proofs, which you know are very much a part of the Christian tradition as well, so you look at Aquinas, he had you know, rational proofs, there's different types of rational proofs. But when was the last time that you offered a rational proof to an atheist that then believed it and became a believer? That's very rare. Right? The whole purpose of rational proofs is to buttress faith that you've been given. And so from an Islamic perspective, that human beings are born believers. Meaning that the natural default state of the human being is that the human being is a believer. And that through entering into the world, that there's, through various types of exposure to different things, that we learn aberrant ideas that take us away from the truth. And that the default state, however, is, is that, that were you to have a certain society that a child is raised in a particular way, that they would naturally believe in certain things. And up on the top of this is a basic belief of cause and effect, which ultimately is one of the great ways to believe, lead you to believe in God. Right? So that we would consider it from this perspective that that the human being is homo religiosus, meaning that we are believers by nature. And that from a more philosophical perspective, is that, that, that in Islam, that when we talk about certainty, when we talk about truth as opposed to falsehood, that truth is defined simply as that which is and necessarily must be. Whereas falsehood by definition is that that which is not and necessarily must not be. And so certainty, in, in according to Islam, is a person aligning himself with the very way that things are. And so it's that process of, in a sense, self-discovery that one allows them to align themselves. And so what I mean by that is, is that there, you know, there's mechanisms that assist the human being in that, but it requires a desire within the human being to be able to have it become unfolded to them, the seed of potentiality to know truth that exists within them. And I'm not just using fancy words to confuse you, I'm really serious about this. That we believe that the human being has the seed within them to know truth. And that what happens is, is that if <coughs> any human being that really wants to come to discover that seed of potentiality and takes the practical steps to do that, that's all the human being can do ultimately is to want to have that desire to come to the truth and then embark on a, upon a path 
to seek it. And what I would say is, is that you know, a good percentage of the people in our time don't take the questions of ultimate concern seriously. A good percentage of human beings, especially in our time. Where that if we really truly were rational people, that we would be preoccupied about the major questions in life. You know, where do we come from? What is the purpose of our life here? And where are we going? And I would argue that the majority of people don't really take that seriously. They might have certain windows where there's a death in the family, or they have a near-death experience, or for a period of time they think about it, but then that because that we also are scared to deal with the unknown, the unknowability of what happens after death is the most terrifying thing to the human being, to not exist or to potentially not exist, or this unknown of transferring into another realm. This is one of the, the you know, scariest aspects of the human being. So that, that there is a objective standard, though, you know, to demonstrate truth and to observe truth. And that it's done in two ways. Is that the foundation of it is, is that human desire and the decisions that we make, right, to take that path to attain truth. And that there's the second level, which is, that, which is the realm of the intellect, which where we can objectify and objectively know whether something is in accordance with the intellect or it's not in accordance with the intellect. But the higher levels of knowledge of the truth, that it is experiential without doubt. But it's experiential but buttressed by the intellect. And one of the greatest of the, the normative theologians of Islam, Imam Lozadi, this was his great contribution. His great contribution, this is why he's called a Pujjati Islam, the proof of Islam, is that he said that in terms of our epistemology, the way in which we come to know, that there's what is called the lohan mahfud. And this is a technical term, but he says that this is what is known as the preserved tablet. And Muslims believe that in the preserved tablet, that all of the divine decrees that have been written for everything that happened, everything that will happen, exist within the lohan mahfud. And that epistemology he was very concerned with. And what he says is, is that the higher level of knowledge ultimately is that the heart is like a mirror and it has the potential ability to reflect that which is in the Lohan Mahfur, the preserved habit, which is what is and what will be. And he mentions five different barriers through which, and we won't go into those details, that the heart, because it's like a mirror, might not reflect that which is in the preserved habit. And then on top of that, that that once that heart is reflected, is that or once that reality is reflected in the heart, that it's through this what his doctrine of what he calls experience or love, that a human being comes to a higher level of knowledge of reality. So that that Muslims would agree from one perspective that there is a super rational element to that, but it doesn't neglect as well that the the buttressing of intellect. So, in relation to the question as it pertains to the Prophet Muhammad said, that there's various ways of ascertaining the proof of his prophecy. One that we know is that in a historical sense, in terms of the historicity of the Qur'an and the Prophet Muhammad said, it's an entirely different phenomenon than the historicity of Jesus and let alone the prophets of the, uh, of the Hebrew scriptures. scriptures. It's a very different process. And that you know, to lump Muslim scripture with the New Testament and the Old Testament offends Jews, so we'll say the Hebrew scriptures, is a big mistake because it's a different phenomenon entirely. And that we have copies of the Quran that were from the earliest time, from the different copies that were, were codified by Earth Man, who was a famous case. The entire Quran was written down on a type of problem, so I say. And that if we look at the very scriptures, you know, New Testament and the Old Testament, that we didn't have it. The oldest version of the Old Testament that we have is 10th century. So it's a totally different phenomenon. They don't even know that, you know, what type of, of Hebrew that Moses even really spoke. Hebrew became a dead language. They used Muslim dictionaries to, you know, re you know, the Hebrew language. And the same thing is when you get into Hindu scripture as, as well as others. And the, the point is, is that 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 I think it's very clear that there's certain historical elements of Islam that are very different. And that we know 
that there was a historical element of the Prophet existing. And there's other ways to approve it from outside the Islamic from outside the Islamic tradition. But in the end, that one of the greatest ways to ascertain the veracity of the Prophet is that when you expose yourself to his teachings. And that his teachings are very clear cut, they're there before us. And that using your intellect to understand his teachings. For me, one of the main things that did it for me is that one of the things that I was troubled with was that you know, again, related to what you're saying, the various claims of truth. And to me, I, I was growing up, I grew up in the Episcopal tradition. And that, you know, there were certain problems that I had with certain tenets of faith in Christianity. That, you know, I didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. I didn't believe in the Trinity. I had trouble with original sin and others. I had troubles with the historicity of the Bible. And that, you know, that to me, I was uh, abhorred by you know, someone claiming that um, you know, the, the King James translation is the literal word of God, and not even Jesus you know, didn't even might have spoken Greek and known a little Greek, but he spoke Aramaic. So how do we explain that the early scriptures were in Greek when he spoke Aramaic? And the earliest of the four Synoptic Gospels was not compiled until the year 70 AD. And how do we explain the discrepancies? And you know Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then we have the Gospel of John, which is the fourth main gospel. How do we explain that? To me, that was very troubling. Anyways, that one of the things that really opened up my mind was to me that, you know, religion, if it's true, it has to be true with a capital T. That it has to give you an overarching perspective, the way that you're going to understand everything. And that was the main thing that did it for me. So, especially when I learned that Muslims believe in all prophets and messengers. To me, one of the greatest testimonies of the veracity of a prophet is that the names of Jesus and Muhammad are mentioned in the Quran, of Jesus and Moses are mentioned in the Quran much more than the name of the Prophet Muhammad. And that there's an acceptance of human history collectively that Muslims are required to believe in every single prophet and messenger that was sent to mankind. And that there's 25 that the Quran mentions explicitly. And there's certain narrations that indicate there was a total of 124,000 prophets. And there are certain narrations that indicate there was 313 or 314 or 15 messengers, but it's not definitive. But meaning that we believe that every people was sent a prophet. And to me, that, you know, was like, wow. That you mean to tell me that, that I can understand that everything that happened before, based upon that perspective, because you can. And that now the details of how you fill in the blanks. You know, that oftentimes it becomes difficult because the Native Americans definitely had prophets. But what remained from the prophetic teachings in the various understandings of the various tribes, that might be difficult to ascertain without, you know, revelation. Uh, but, you know, these type of things that, that, you know, they're clearly things that relate to the realm of the intellect, but at the same time that, you know, they, they point to another aspect of the veracity of the prophet of life center. And you combine that to his teachings that when you access them and you see the change in your life, one of the main reasons people believe in religion is because it works for them. It works for them. And they see the transformation in their life. Now, I wouldn't define that only in itself, but that is definitely, you know, consideration. And then when you add that to the intellectual sphere, as well as, you know, the, the super rational, which is based upon experience after that, then I think that there's clear impetus that it leads to a very you know, objectifiable version of truth. You know, and um, that the, the thing that I will say on top of all of that is that when you've had experiences with people that are living links in this chain, that go back to the problem of public that this is one of the main reasons why people come to believe is their interaction with other human beings. And which might not oftentimes be the most rational from that perspective. But this is one of the, the, this is number one of the five reasons why people convert is interacting with others, you know, other Muslims. And, you know, this is, could be a phenomenon as well, related to other types of people. But, uh, it's kind of a long answer, but this is, talks and talks. there any more questions? Sisters? Sisters, is there any questions for sisters? Um, 
concerning history and um, concerning what you mentioned about seeking intellectual simulation and discourse. So from what I know and have read, knowledge it's the knowledge itself in the past, say in the what many people call the classical golden age of Islam. Knowledge whether it was um theology, um, literature, law, politics, science, medicine, astronomy, etc. They were the way I see it, they were in one scope and Muslim scholars of the past, they were polymaths or renaissance men who had mastery. People like um, Imam Ghazali, Ibn Sina, Ibn Arus, Ibn al Haytham, and all these other scientists and scholars. So, so they were these polymaths and renaissance, mo renaissance men. So, what my question is what caused this um, big sphere of knowledge to break down into? religion on one religion theology and you could say metaphysics philosophy on one side and practical science um and other things on the other side and concerning that there's an astrophysicist professor neil degrafe tyson who's an agnostic and he's a contemporary of richard dawkins but he said this he said that if muslim if the Muslim knowledge had not collapsed like this, and you took the total population of Muslims, and you calculated, you calculated, um, so he compared the Muslim population to the Jewish population, and said, the Jewish population is this much, yet this is how many Nobel Prizes or big discoveries they have made. Now, if you took the Muslim population, and which is much larger than the Jewish population, and Islamic knowledge had not bro broken down in the past. Right. How many Nobel Prizes do you think would, Muslims have, won? would have won? Yes. Right. So my question is, how? First, what caused the breakdown of this knowledge? And second is, what can I or anyone else do yeah. pragmatically right now and in the long run? We're going to be here for two weeks to answer your question. Develop a whole course of services. That that's a whole course, and you know, it's studied. And I don't know if I'm the most qualified to even, you know, you know, answer that question because that's a huge, huge, huge topic. We have to know our limits. But, you know, I don't know that I would say that except maybe basically that you could say that, you know, you're absolutely right that, that Muslims had a you know, very unique perspective to knowledge. And that, that you know, I kind of held back the reins today talking in the clip because I didn't want to say anything that would be deemed controversial. I think I could probably say it in this context. Is that, that for us, that all pursuit of knowledge is a sacred pursuit. Because the name of the law, one of the names is Al Ali, he's the all known. And so for us, all pursuit of knowledge, whether it be related to the human being, whether it be related to the cosmos and everything that's in it, all of the other breakdown, biology, chemistry, physics, geology, and so forth and so on, whether it be related to that the understanding of God, which is termed theology, all of the spheres of what could potentially be known, that for us it's all a sacred, it's all a sacred pursuit. And what we mean by that is, is that there's no knowledge that cannot, that cannot not be integrated, to use a double negative, that into that a vision of Tobi is that for us, is that absolutely there's a relationship between all types of knowledge. There's a relationship between all types of knowledge that pertain to the human being, in a physiological sense, in a psychological sense, in an emotional <coughs> sense, overall related to the human being, and then there's a relationship between those knowledges that pertain to the human being and the greater cosmos at the micro level and the macro level, and that there's definitely a relationship between both those two types of knowledge to the creator. Because these are the three spheres, in a sense, of knowledge. Man, cosmos, God. And what is the relationship between the three? This is the request of human pursuits you know, throughout human history. And so Muslim, Muslims un, you know, understood that very clearly. And Muslim scientists, and even, that you mentioned, Muslim philosopher scientists, because many of them were philosophers and scientists, like Ibn Sina and others, that they had different focuses, obviously. But... 
they were working, even though at times that they diverted from a traditional perspective, that they were working on that on, on a theocentric perspective. And meaning that they were relating everything overall, ultimately, to God. And emanation theory has been seen, it clearly shows that. And that, you know, so that, that was definitely the case. And that the details of what exactly happened and how that broke down, that's a very complicated story. You know, that you know, some of the versions I don't accept. Like some people say that Imam Ghazali came along and that it was going fine and then that was it. I mean, <laughs> such a, you know, really, there's people that say that. I've actually watched videos that say that. And there's people that, and that's, that's, not, that's not true. You know, the proof of it is, is that, that you know, Imam Ghazali synthesized philosophy. And it's, it went on, you know, and, and it still exists to this day. There's still places in the Muslim world where it's taught, traditional philosophy. And that, so that, that's, you can't say that. There's a number of, there's historical precedent for that. Because if we look at the heyday of what's turned in the West, the Golden Age, which I wouldn't term it that, but, you know, where you have, like, the Beit HaKikmah, the House of Wisdom, you have the translation of all these texts uh, from the Greek tradition and from from, and from Sanskrit also into Arabic, sometimes by other languages like Syriac and so forth, and these you know, the center where various traditions are being translated ultimately into Arabic, in which Muslims were exposed to you know, various civilizations in the world, that Muslims were never scared to do that, to embark upon this intellectual quest. But what was important for them is the integration of that knowledge, but based upon certain principles of integration, and that it was it was what was integrated and how it was integrated, which was important. And so that when you have, for instance, caliphs like Mahmoud who sponsored that, you know, pass and cease, that oftentimes those that came after them didn't have the same intellectual pursuits. And so that's definitely a contributing factor. And that there's many other contributing factors as well. And that it might have been that there was more focus placed upon certain realms of intellectual pursuit than others. But, you know, I, I would argue in principle, that you know it's important you know that that whatever happened had to happen one thing i will say though is is that and i'll get to the last part of what do we do now is that one thing i'll say though is that in, in the western sense is that in the renaissance and what happened then and you know during the time of the enlightenment and post enlightenment which again is a huge topic of import, uh, that what, what you started to see happen is that you know we, we forget there was what was called natural theology where most of the first scientific pursuits were based upon a worldview of belief in God. You know, and that when that certain findings seem to contradict, you know, apparently with you know, traditional Catholic doctrine, that this was definitely one of the reasons of the split of revelation and reason. And the way that that's interconnected to the Reformation and the splitting you know, uh, in, 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 there's the Great Schism that was in, I guess, 1092 between the Greek Orthodox and the Catholic Church, but then later the Reformation, where you had the Protestant, the Protestant Reformation, that, you know, a lot of, there were several reasons for that. One of them was this whole idea of the clergy, and that there, as it pertains to knowledge, and access to that knowledge. So you have in the West that what started to develop was a, there was a divorce between the intellectual inquiry and revelation. Because there were certain things that were just, you, there was no way to reconcile what they came to understand scientifically and what was a part of doctrine in church. And that, that, that was definitely one of the reasons, and there's much more nuance that, and there's many more. So that one of the important questions we have to ask is, is that there's a particular worldview behind modern science. And to me, it's a total mistake for Muslims to think that, you know, we have to jump on board and have more noble pies with us. To me, I don't accept that. Right? Because there's certain things that are definitely in conflict that in terms of underlying assumptions and the way that knowledge is viewed that we would never fully agree with. You know, then that brings up another question that, you know, what do we do? And so I, I'm very critical of kind of the modernist Muslim type approach, which thinks that, you know, the result is to, you know, just become more scientific. That lest we forget the condition of the world, 
that one of the reason the world is in the condition of it is, is because of the misuse of science. And that if you look at the way that, I mean, why is it in every department, you know, why is it, you know, which is one of the reasons why the Islamic Studies Department are folded. This is it one of the reasons why that all humanities departments nationwide, that they're starting to wane, right? Because they can't justify funding for them anymore, right? But the departments of biology, the departments, you know, medicine, all of these things that where you can have some type of practical result, they're getting funded you know, greatly. And you know that, that to me that's a serious you know, that's a serious concern. And one, one of the things that's happened that in this kind of post enlightenment type enlightenment type attitude is that that people have come to believe in technology, and that once the world itself has become desacralized, meaning that you no longer look at the world as a creation of God. Muslims distinguish between the dunya, which is the world in its lower sense, the destruction of God, between the island, which is the cosmos, right? which, which, you know, the cosmos comes from a Greek word that means ornament. And that in, in, in Arabic, the alam comes from alam. The world is seen as a sign. And we believe that everything in creation has a type of life. And so that, that once you remove a sacred view of nature, and such that it becomes that uh, mechanistic, which is what has happened now, and this happened post enlightenment that then that is all about manipulation. And so modern man's approach to science, and I'm not talking about your professor who's just into, you know, some type of experiment, you know, in the, in the you might have people that you know, aren't actively taking part in this, but in general, that he wouldn't get funding for what he's trying to do unless there was some way to attach it to this overall objective. And that the, so what I'm essentially trying to say is, is that modern technology in all of its different forms, that you know, oftentimes that it's used ultimately to assert man's domination over earth. And that is a very post-enlightenment thing that Muslims that should have nothing to do with. And that, that I, I, I would argue is very destructive right, to, in, to the environment. It's very destructive to personal relationships. Right? If your whole purpose of doing you know, science, so studies in, in neuroscience, is to prove that the human being doesn't have a soul or spirit, and that it's just about a bunch of flashing, a flashing of neurons, and there's no reality to the spirit. To me, that one, that you can never prove that. Because we have to differentiate here between science and scientism. That science, as it's come to understood, is one thing. Right? And there's different ways that science could potentially exist, which is another thing that people have never consider. Because people are so close-minded. But scientism is something else entirely. And scientism is drawing metaphysical or philosophical implications from the findings of science, which is impossible. And it's the most illogical thing that you could possibly do, which is a, a you know, even the, the, uh, the most acclaimed scientists do rigor, that they develop philosophical conclusions based on, so to me, that no matter how much that you prove that certain aspects of consciousness are related to the flashing of neurons and so forth, that you want to undermine the spirit, that you can, it never does prove that. What it proves is that there's other physio ph physiological realities that relate to something that is beyond the material realm anyway. You can't disprove it. Right? And to me, science can never disprove God. And the whole reason science can never disprove God is because God is outside of the realm of science. Science is not focused upon that which is not a part of the tangible world. So how could it disprove or prove for that matter? It can't. It's impossible. What it can do from a standpoint of belief <coughs> is it can point to God, which is that's what it is. It's, an app. it's a signpost that points to the existence of God. And then if someone has the divine gift of faith and then looks at the world from that perspective, and then that combines the experiential component, which the reality of faith is a light that God places in your heart, all of it comes together. And it makes perfect sense. But that science can never disprove it. And so that I think as Muslims that, that we need to be very wary and very critical 
And that when you step up to the plate, like to deal with these type of topics, right, you're dealing with 107 mile an hour fastballs. You're in the big leagues and you're dealing with heavyweights. And this is why you have to educate yourself. And that I would love to do a degree, a PhD in physics. I really would. I love physics. I, you know, there's only so much time that we have. But I love science. I love physics in particular. That's my inclinations. But, uh, that's my inclination. I know there's no time to do that. But, you know, if you're going to step up to refute, I'm just pointing to some very general ideas here. But if you step up the plate, you better put your, you know, be ready for a heavyweight battle. And so we have to educate ourselves. You know, and become well informed, and that the solution out of it, like any other fitness, is not easy. You know, it's going to require a radical departure from the way that things are. You know, to set up some type of analogy, though, let me say this: is that we, we that everyone's talking about globalism now. But the the way that globalism is manifested in its current form is one possibility of its method, way of it. There is multiple other ways that the world could have become globalized. That in our understanding of globalism, globalism in the modern sense is tied to an economic system. And that you can't separate it from that. And that the way that the world is being globalized, such that you hop on a plane and you find people wearing the same, you know, holy blue jeans, holy not in religious sense, <laughs> that, that people are wearing in you know, in San Francisco, before you hop on the plane, that creates a global monoculture that, which is based upon the eclipse of the intellect, and such that you have, you know, horizontal man, and I mean in generic sense, humankind, without any vertical dimension. That, you know, that to me is, is you know, sad, first and foremost, but secondly, that that's not the only way they could have happened. That there's a number of other ways. That Islam never created a monoculture, ever. And that's why I would argue that the true question, this is based upon you know, my teachers and what they say, is that can liberals tolerate Islam? That to me is really the question. Not the other way around. Can Islam tolerate liberals? And Sid Abu Hakimah has an article about that, if you want to read about that you can look, you know, further, where he brings out some of the glorious aspects of the Ahl al the Limmi system, which now is a great topic of debate. But it, it shows the very different side that the modern liberal societies are the most intolerant side, societies in the world from a certain aspect. Right, they're, they're very intolerant. You know, if we're going to, and one example of that is, is that if we're going to say everyone has the right to do what they want, why can't our Muslim sisters represent? Right, you have the right to do whatever you want. Why is there a friend? Why are you considered to be a Why? And on and on and on and on. That why why does that even exist? So, anyways, these are just some very basic insights. But you know, the way out of it is is that that you know that we number one educate ourselves, and that we take a life of study, <clears throat> and we find like-minded people, and we have the courage to go back into the depths and learn the necessary languages that you're going to need. The most important of which are Arabic and Persian. Right? And so people want answers, but oftentimes they're not willing to put in the time to do it. And that we go back, we have thousands upon thousands of manuscripts that are incredible treaties of all different types of topics related to science, astronomy, medicine, and so forth. And that we analyze and we see the way it is done. And we start to question some of the underlying assumptions of modern science. And we start to poke holes in that. And we start to offer you know, other ways of doing the world. Now, that once you start to do that, you're going to be completely and totally sidelined, and that you know, no one's going to publish your article, and no one, for the most part, is even going to listen to you, and they'll make personal intellectual attacks on you. But you know, that's just part of living in the time that we live. So, you know, at the same time, we need people to do that. And that that's Uh, it's a lot of